Good afternoon and welcome to the China Med Tel Aviv University China in the Mid Med Connectivity and Security series of online seminars. This series of events look, uh, looks at China's role in the wider Middle East and Mediterranean region from the inside out perspective and is intended to complement an earlier series that looked at China's role in the Mid Med from a global perspective. My name is Ori Sella and I am the chair of the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University. My co-hosts are Professor Enrico Fardella, the director of uh, Peking University's Center for Mediterranean Area Studies, MAS, and director of the China Med Research Project, and Professor Brendan Friedman, the director of research at Tel Aviv University's Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies. It is my privilege to introduce our guests and panelists for today's seminar, China's Infrastructure and Logistics in the Mid-Med. Unlike many other events that bring strictly academic perspective, it is our view that we have a lot to learn and share with practitioners who on a daily basis deal with these issues on the ground or in today's panel on the sea. By the way, we were supposed to have uh, prominent women practitioners on board, but they had to cancel due to unforeseen managerial duties. But with us today are um, Massimo D'Andres, is a general manager of SRM, an economic research center related to the Intesa San Paolo Banking Group, specialized in the Italian economy, energy issues, and maritime economy in a European and Mediterranean perspective. He is also currently president of GEI, the Italian Society of Business Economists, and professor of business management at University of Turin. With us today also Mr. Fulvio Lino Di Blasio, Secretary General of the Port System Authority, Mar Ionio, based at the Port of Taranto since May 2017. Formerly, he served as Director in Ernst & Young Financial Business Advisors, and he is a senior expert in the field of transport and logistics infrastructure. As such, he's, uh, supported, uh, he has supported the Italian Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport, working as coordinator of the team in charge of the Str strategies for transport and logistics infrastructures in 2016, the national guidelines for evaluating the infrastructural projects of all transport modes, also in 2016, and the national strategic plan for ports and logistics a year earlier. Last but not least is Captain Igal Maol. Captain Igal Maol is the Director General of the Administration of Shippings and Ports at Israel's Ministry of Transportation. After serving in the Israeli Merchant Navy in command uh, positions, Captain Maor served in various senior ex uh, executive management positions in Tsim, Integrated Shipping Services, head office, and as a member of Tsim's senior management team. Captain Maor holds Master's Marinier FG certificate, teaches maritime courses, at the University of Haifa in the Faculty of Management, Business and Administration Department, Shipping and Ports Program. Thank you uh, for joining us today. So let's get started. Our goal for this event is to discuss China's role in infrastructure and logistics in the region with an emphasis on how it affects countries in the Middle East and Mediterranean regions, both in terms of opportunities, but also challenges. I would like to begin asking each of you to address this topic from your own experience and perspective. With your permission, let us begin with Fulvio and Igal, who can bring their specific location into the discussions, and then Massimo, who may provide for a larger overview. So, um, Fulvio, would you like to uh, begin? Okay, Taranto is uh, uh, one of the major ports of the Italian system, and that is uh, my point of view. It starts from there. Um, or better, Taranto has been one of the major ports of the Italian system, and exactly some years ago, six years ago, was the second port of uh, Italian port in terms of throughput. And um, after these uh, years, uh, we uh, experienced big problems due to the crisis of 2008, 
Then, uh, after uh, a period of a uh, couple of years where things were going better, around the 2011, we experienced a deep Italian um, the, the crisis of the steel plant in uh, in uh, in Taranto, Ilva, and uh, also our terminal container company, there was a consortium composed by Evan Green and Hutchinson. They left our port and went to Paris. So we we had uh, that po that moment uh, the idea to take the chance to renovate completely our terminal and then uh, to invest. Uh, around the 500, uh, 500 million euros in uh, of public investment in the port. After that, we are now back in the market, and uh, we uh, were able to attract the attention of a number of investors. And one of that is uh, Ilport Holding, that now is our concessioner for. 49 years of the container terminal. So this is very important because after that, we are now back in the uh, top, I guess, uh, uh, investment opportunities in the countries. And uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, experiencing this interest also together with the Intesa San Paolo in some of uh, our global events uh, and uh, recently in Beijing as well. And in that, uh, in that meetings, we saw that the, the Chinese attention was uh, uh, changing a little bit uh, with a specific focus on the MED area. Uh, Massimo will, 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 tell us, will tell us about what, what changed in the, in the last years in the, in the Mediterranean. And uh, for this reason, we, we were uh, we have been contacted by a number of companies in the field of infrastructure and logistics because uh, the, the Taranto was now uh, a, a new port because without the, the, you know, the commercial si uh, pillar of our strategy, we were just an industrial port with uh, huge players like ArcelorMittal or Lark ENI for the petrol uh, traffic. But uh, the commercial side as well also the, the cruise uh, part of our business is now a, a new point of attraction. Now the Chinese approach is uh, um, very, very, of course, planned. Now we are talking about the BRI, but that is something that's been planning, planned a number of decades ago. And we are just now experiencing uh, what the, the results of, the, of this planning. First, my first consideration is that in the port system, we, we think that the approach of the European Union is not such uh, strong as uh, the Chinese one. There is no a strong European um, strategy on the Italian, of the, on the European port system in the area. And this is why the, 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 the interest of the Chinese government and of the public uh, uh, companies, uh, Chinese public companies, is uh, so strong and specific in what? In the looking for infrastructure opportunities. So may, generally speaking, our experience is they, they, they go firstly to with the, the, the construction uh, capability. So they, they put in place they, in the, their capability to, to build huge infrastructure in, in ports, in logistics, in roads, in rail, in airport, and everything. The approach was a, a systematic approach also in our case, in our situation. And um, of course, now after that, they look at other opportunities to bring traffic and to bring uh, logistics and, uh, and the opportunities of, of business. But first of all, our, our experience was they were looking at Taranto if there was something to be. And after a while, we, uh, of course, uh, added the first preliminary uh, approach. And then we were back in the agenda also of the Italian um, cabina di regia, Italian uh, table that is managed by the Ministry of External Affairs, together with the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport. And what is interesting is that uh, for a couple of years, uh, just uh, Trieste and uh, uh, Genoa 
were the two main point of attention for the Chinese uh, in investors. And uh, for in that case, what is uh, what to differentiate our our uh, possible deal is that uh, uh, is a real construction of a new container terminal uh, platform together with the, the construction of logistics uh, uh, activities uh, connected. Uh, so fr from a general point of view, I would say that uh, they had a very, uh, uh, they, were, they were very aware of the situation of Taranto. They arrived with uh, many, many information on the connectivity, on the intermodality of our port, uh, and also about the, the the gaps that we had, and their plan was uh, to 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 arrive and to build something new in order to make Taranto a, a port that was uh, again connected with the EU uh, business, with the EU network of transport. Uh, and what is interesting is that at a certain moment they arrived uh, with a new terminal operator that is Airport. And Airport, you know, is a group, even holding, uh, that owns the 24% of the CMA CGM. So it is a Turkish company, but with a global uh, business model and with uh, a kind of agreement that was signed, I guess, around September 2019 with the Costco. So they had in their business plan, in their relationship, also this link with the Chinese market. And now they are talking uh, together and uh, to see if there are opportunities for them. And uh, but I don't know, this is uh, something that is related to the market. Um, another thing is that, uh, um, again, within this uh, institutional framework that we have, so the, the different ministries, the, the Chinese government is very keen to talk. They want to talk directly with the public institutions. Generally, they don't, uh, to, according to my experience, they don't want to talk with advisors, uh, with the companies, uh, intermediate, because the system, they are all public owned companies and they want to talk directly with the government. And in fact, uh, what has changed the, the written of the approach is, of course, this, uh, when the, the memorandum uh, of understanding was signed between uh, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Conte. From that moment on, they started with, really with a different approach because in, in their target, they, have, they had to implement this global uh, strategy in the port sector. And uh, of course, they, they uh, were also very keen to involve the local business uh, because they, we, 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 we talked directly about the fact that you know at, lo at a local level sometimes there is uh, some problems to, to have a foreign investment that is uh, without any connection with the local capabilities and connection and they, they were very available to talk and to uh, um, co cooperate with the, the, the companies that were in around the, the southern of, of Italy. Now we, we are, uh, of course, after we were, I am talking about, about something that happened for five or six uh, months ago. Uh, we experienced, a, a, of course, a kind of a standby period and uh, we are trying to, to come back to, 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 those, uh, to those tables because uh, it's very important for, for us. Uh, also because uh, now the, the terminal container is starting the first ship uh, we call Taranto CMA. We will call Taranto in, uh, in these days, uh, on, on Sunday. So this is a big news. So Taranto is really back also from the operative point of view and also with the, uh, a rail connection. And this is very important because this is a demonstration that uh, is a real alternative to, to other port. And, uh, and this is, in, in, in synthesis, this is my, 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 my experience about the, the Chinese investment. Thank you very much, Fulvio. Um, Igal, um, uh, you need to unmute. Okay. 
Um, good morning, everybody. First of all, I wish uh, a lot of success to Mr. Di Blasio. I uh, remember the port of Toronto from the uh, uh, glorious day of uh, Mr. Luigi Maneschi, you know, with the uh, green season and uh, uh, everything which happened with this uh, uh, port, which is really in a very strategic uh, point in Italy, and I think that uh, he deserves a uh, a lot uh, of uh, success, and I hope that with the uh, yield port, with the yield dream uh, group, they really succeed to uh, bring back the glory to uh, to Toronto. Uh, really, uh, Toronto, Toronto and Puglia deserve this. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, going uh, back to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean in general and uh, the uh, Haifa in particular. I would like uh, to say that uh, from uh, a real uh, discussion about logistics uh, issues a few years ago, we are really now uh, stepping in a road full with uh, political minds, you know, and I have to be very careful not to step on uh, one of them. But the whole uh, logistic uh, uh, issue became uh, completely involved with a political uh, argument. And uh, the struggle between uh, uh, China and the United States as uh, we call them, the big elephant in the room, you know, is uh, something which is uh, we have to take it into consideration and uh, to think about uh, it uh, uh, all the time, even that my uh, perspective is completely, uh, as I said, is uh, coming from the logistic uh, point of view. So, uh, as you know, uh, Israel is uh, leaning completely on its maritime uh, trade. About 99% of the Israeli foreign commerce is coming through the port, mainly the two ports, Haifa and Ashdod. And we came really to a situation in which we understood that we have to develop our port. It means to increase, first of all, the, the, of course, the, the draft and the, the, the depth of, of the port and the, the other infrastructures in order to accommodate the ships that uh, uh, grew in an unexpected way. And then we also had to follow up the uh, development of the uh, activity uh, in Israel. And this is why we went on on building those two new uh, terminals. Uh, as you know, we went to an um, uh, uh, international bid, which was open to everybody, uh, including uh, European, American, and uh, Asian uh, participants. And uh, the results were, as everybody knows today, that uh, MSD, uh, namely TIL, uh, uh, took the concession in the port of Ashdod, and the SAPG took the concession uh, the port uh, in Haifa. Uh, talking about the uh, percentage, because I hear, I see in a lot of places that uh, it says that the Chinese are controlling the port of Haifa. Well, the truth have to be said that uh, they will. Uh, uh, operate uh, uh, only uh, something like 15 percent, one five percent of the uh, uh, of the berths in uh, Haifa. Uh, for now, they are only going to do container activity, and they are not involved completely with the marine traffic operations. It means that they can only load and discharge, and uh, and they were they are not uh, they are not controlling the uh, entrances uh, or departures of the vessels in the in the port. So this is the situation now in, uh, in Israel. Uh, the, um, last week we received uh, the first uh, RMGs, uh, the cranes uh, which will uh, run on the shore uh, to accommodate the containers in the, in the stacking area. Uh, in a week from now, we are, the port is going to get the first uh, four uh, uh, ship to shore cranes which are arriving uh, on a special ship from uh, Shanghai from ZPMC. And uh, in about a year from now, uh, even um, hopefully even before, we will start, uh, the port will start to be uh, uh, operational in uh, Haifa and, and uh, so uh, this is regarding the situation uh, uh, here. Uh, um, um, with the Chinese uh, involvement uh, in the uh, container port of uh, uh, Haifa. Uh, I think that the involvement of uh, China here, uh, and we can divide, you know, the, uh, the involvement of the Chinese uh, uh, interest in logistics in the Eastern Mediterranean is divided into two. Uh, one is the, as I, can, uh, as I can say, strategic point of view. And in this group, I think that Pyreus is leading the, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, direction. And the second one is uh, just a normal, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, 
operations and the interest even show that uh, everybody is uh, telling us that uh, the Chinese are not having any uh, innocent uh, intentions. Everything is uh, uh, in purpose, but I think that uh, there is a, uh, it is a, a pure, uh, a pure uh, investment and concession uh, to operate uh, container activity, which can bring a lot of uh, economical uh, profit to the uh, to the uh, Chinese. Uh, and I'm talking uh, logistic-wise. I, I leave the security issues to other people, which are experts in this area, which I'm not involved with. I don't understand nothing about it. Of course, you can see the potential of Haifa. Uh, in the connection uh, eastward uh, through the new uh, railway uh, uh, from uh, Haifa to uh, the uh, border with uh, Jordan, uh, later on uh, the connection from Jordan to Saudi Arabia, and then uh, there is a railway from uh, the Jordanian border up down to uh, Riyadh and uh, Damam and other port, uh, ports in the uh, in the uh, western shores of the uh, Arabian Gulf. Uh, and this could be something which the Chinese took into consideration, and this also explains why they were so interested in Haifa and not in Ashdod, which is the uh, uh, which is sitting really on the uh, heaviest economical interland of uh, Israel. So um, I don't uh, see any for now any uh, serious intentions, as was said in the beginning, to uh, build and operate a train from a lot to uh, Ashdod or to or to Haifa. We have to also to understand that the ALAT is a very limited uh, port. Uh, it's a very limited uh, a draft uh, port. You cannot uh, dredge the port of ALAT because of environmental uh, constraints. And uh, the ships which are calling today the Red Sea range, uh, namely uh, uh, Port Sudan, uh, Jeddah, uh, Aqaba, etc., which are ships of 6,000 to I would say 5,000 to 6,000 and 7,000 years cannot call a, a lot at all. So I'm not uh, sure about the interests uh, which everybody is uh, talking about in, uh, in uh, a lot. Okay, uh, sorry, a brief. Uh... Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Igal. Um, and now to Massimo. Yeah, thank you. I try to share my screen because I have a presentation. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yep. Perfect. Wonderful. So just one second. Okay, perfect. Great. So, um, good afternoon. And while you are seeing uh, the three points of my agenda, which are, I mean, more uh, with a more global view in comparison with the two previous uh, speakers, I would also uh, use this one, one first minute to, to thanks very much uh, Professor Orisela for, uh, for this invitation together with my friend Enrico, Enrico Fardella. Uh, so as you can see, the first point of my agenda is a picture of uh, the maritime economy before COVID, especially in the Mediterranean with a focus on the role of China. Then we will move on the impact of COVID on the global trade and shipping, and again, the role of China, and some conclusion on uh, the, the role of logistics and um, connectivity for uh, competitiveness. Um, let me start with a brief overview on global maritime economy. Let's remember, I think it's important to remember that 90%, as you can see, of the world trade is by maritime mode. Uh, that means almost 12 billion tons, plus 32% in the last 10 years. A vast majority of this trade is by dry, dry bulk, then liquid bulk, followed by containers, 16%. In 2019, 41% of the total shipping trade was in Asian port, as you can see. Um, in the last 10 years, we had a significant improvement for Mediterranean ports. They increased their market share. If we compare 2019 with 2010, we see that the North European ports that still are more efficient, we must remember that, 
in any case, not European ports in this period, 2010, 2019, decline from 44% to 39% of the global Euro-Mediterranean market shares, while in the same period of time, the different parts of the South Mediterranean, so the global South Mediterranean ports increased, sorry, increased from 38 to 42%. Uh, if we look at the containers, that we must remember are the main modality for manufacturing trade, we see that in the last five years, we had a constant increase in containers trade in the Mediterranean with a significant growth of 21%. This was due clearly to the Chinese growing role in the Mediterranean and the opening of the new Suez Canal in 2016. In fact, since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, China grew its strate strategic positioning in the Mediterranean. And here we have a clear picture that I also posted in my presentation last year, and I also posted in the presentation we did in Beijing. Fulvio, just to remember that when we were together for the, the mission we have uh, with potential uh, in Chinese investors. Uh, in this picture, you have the strategic positioning of the Chinese, in, of the Chinese uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, they have the total control of the Paris port, they have a significant role in some of the most important ports in the Mediterranean and in North Europe, they have a growing role in Israeli port, you know better than mine, we, we just heard. Uh, they have a key role in Port Said, which is the Mediterranean port of the Suez Canal, they also have a significant role in Dubai. Uh, in 2016, Costco started to operate in Genoa, they signed a memorandum uh, with Trieste, we have just heard uh, the positioning of Taranto, so they, they are more and more interested in, in entering in Italy. So the point is that the Mediterranean is, a strategic, is, is strategic for the Chinese because it's a crossroad to reach Europe in the north and the MENA countries in the south. And this region, this Euro-Mediterranean, -Medi or, or better saying Euro-MENA region, together we must remember is more or less 20,000 billion of GDP, at least ante COVID. But in any case, the most important GDP area in the world with the Mediterranean in the middle. And reaching the Mediterranean means also reaching an area where if you want, you can pass through Jabal Tire and you have the option to reach the north of Europe or to reach um, the east coast of the United States. But as I said, at least that was the scenario until January 2020. But we know something unexpected happened at the beginning uh, of this year. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as you can see, is having a huge impact on global economy and trade. And this changing paradig paradigm uh, worldwide, quarterly trade of goods drop at uh, minus 27% is the blue line in that uh, figure compa in comparison with the same period of 2019. Yearly trade of goods drop at minus 5% is the red line. In the second quarter, expected to decline to minus 20% for, uh, for the full 2020 year. Uh, world export is as explicative of this situation. And looking at the monthly percentage from January to May for the different countries, we can clearly perceive that COVID, sorry, the COVID-19 wave that starts in China then follow in Europe and now is in United States and more generally in, in, uh, in America. Because we had minus 22% of export in China in January with a recovery in April and a new drop in May. We had minus 30% in Europe in March. We had minus 29% in, in United States in May. So everywhere we had a dramatic falls. Uh, and as consequence, we had sharp decline in ports, especially the two most important ports in Europe and China, Shanghai and Rotterdam. Shanghai lost 8.5% from January to April. Rotterdam lost a little less, 47 But the point is that we only have data for 
three months, January, March, not for May, uh, April and, 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 and May. So I think the defense with Shanghai will be not so, uh, so, so important. And another point is that on the main east-west routes, the numbers of cancelled, what we call blank sailing between April and, uh, and June was uh, 257 ships, equal to almost 3 million TEUs, containers lost. So a very important figure. Another angle to see this situation is Suez, which is a, a gauge of traffic trends and Chinese presence in the Mediterranean. And here, if we look uh, at the, the figure, we see that the total number of ships in the period between January to May increased plus 7%. But if we look more in details, we see that the positive performances of oil tankers and dry barker is mainly due to regional traffic from the Gulf to the Mediterranean and vice versa. While container ship, as you can see, decline by 15%. And this is the indicator of the fall of high value manufacturing trade from Asia to Europe. Very, very clear. Uh, we can see now two pictures that explain this situation very well, I think. I think. The red line is the intensity of container ship passages from Asia to Europe and vice versa in 2019, so before COVID. It's the picture, we can say, it's the picture of the Belt and Road, okay? Now we have the picture of the first part of this pandemic year, the five months of this 2020. We see a reduction of the intensity of the red line along the traditional route via Suez for container ship. This is only for container ship, okay? So we see, uh, I mean, the reduction of the intensity of the red line, but more important, we see some container ship the, that decided to pass through the Cape of Good Hope, you see, uh, across Africa, uh, because despite the longer route, the, current, the, the currently lower price of oil and the fact that not paying Suez toll, which is expensive, represent finally a positive trade-off to reduce sailing costs and to reduce, uh, I mean, the cost of, of, of the transportation. So, very interesting, because a part of a, a number of ships decided to use another route, longer route, but less expensive, if we want, in that specific moment, because of oil price. So the point is that there is a permanent need to search for new options and new routes to save money. And this is true also in the high north, the Arctic. From 2011 to 2019, the North Sea route had a significant increase of traffic, plus 134%. Uh, also in the first part of this pandemic here, we had an additional plus 15%. We have to keep in mind that from Japan to Rotterdam, the North Sea route has 19 days of navigation versus 31 days via Suez. So two weeks faster is a lot of time and money. Uh, from Shanghai to Rotterdam, one week faster. Uh, we have just published a specific paper on the Arctic route exploring, exploring not only the maritime uh, route, but also energy, uh, issues, uh, you know, there are a lot of resources uh, over there. We explore also the juridical and the legal status, which is quite com complicated, climate, climate change and environmental impact also, uh, geoeconomic, geopolitical. I mean, I don't have the time to elaborate more, but I, I can come back if you want during the debate. The only point, the only things I want to say is that the Arctic route is not for tomorrow, this is clear. But we, especially, I use we in the sense that you in Israel, we in Italy, we are part of the Mediterranean area. We in the Mediterranean area, we must look uh, at that, I mean, at the Arctic with a, a lot of attention for future development. It's not for tomorrow, but for a longer future, 
perhaps yes. So we should look with a lot of attention. Um, so we have seen the drop in world trade as a consequence of COVID-19. We have seen the fall in container ship. We have seen that the Arctic is now an option where China is, is entering. And I forgot to say that Costco in 2019 is a very interesting figure to have in mind. Costco last year, 2019, was the most active shipping company in the Arctic, covering 19% of all trips. We have seen the need to search for new routes. The example of Cape of Good Hope in this moment, due to the low level of oil price. We have seen Suez. I mean, how will China Belt and Road Initiative be affected by pandemic that is shaking the world everywhere? We have, we know, this is official, 138 countries involved. Uh, 2,951 Belt and Road projects for a value which is around approximately 4 trillion of dollars. It's not possible not to be involved. So the pandemic will definitely have a significant economic impact on the Belt and Road. This is for sure. We don't know how much, but the answer is yes, in my opinion. China growing role, a growing influence in the Mediterranean in the last 10 years at least, was based on building a role as an economic actor, as an economic player, as an economic partner, while keeping a low profile in other areas of interest, such as military cooperation, diplomacy, politics. Building ports, logistics, infrastructures was a key element uh, in this strategy. Currently, it is possible, it's possible, and perhaps also probable, but let's leave to the debate that COVID-19 could harm China's reputation and therefore put this strategy on the line. So how can this situation be overcome? I think that one reply, re reply not of course not the only reply, but one reply could be by improving logistic efficiency. Why? Uh, I really think, these are my last two slides, I really think that logistic efficiency and connectivity together, not one or the other, not logistic or connectivity, together are the new challenges in international maritime competitiveness. And the point is that China is not in the top 10 of logistic performance index, while it holds the first place in shipping connectivity index. Europe, on the other hand, uh, is the first player in logistic performance, but not so good in connectivity. So both Europe and China need to invest more to improve connectivity and logistic efficiency, but in a complementary way. And let me uh, finish, uh, finally, let me show you the results of an exercise that we did. It's just a sort of um, intellectual exercise. Uh, we put the logistic performance index in relation with the number of COVID-19 cases per million of habit in inhabitants for some countries. We are trying to do that for all the countries, but now I have just some countries. What it seems to emerge is that countries with a higher efficiency in logistics, like Germany, are probably more able, and perhaps we, also, we must also ponderate this analysis with the dimension of the countries. We do not yet done, but I think we will, we will do that. In any case, Germany is a big country. So, um, it seems that it seems to emerge that countries with a higher efficiency in logistics, and Germany is the example, are probably more able to manage crises like pandemic, because logistics is also a way to speed up supply chain, 
and uh, this is especially true for uh, emergency provision or in time of crisis like like COVID is and and and, and was. So what this pandemic teaches us is that investing in logistics and connectivity, and for maritime countries like uh, Italy and Israel, that means to invest in port logistics, is a strategic move both to support the economy of the country, but also to make the country more resilient to crisis. At least this is my contribution to the debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo. Um, Eagle and uh, Pulvio, I'd, I'd love to hear your uh, reactions um, to what Massimo just uh, suggested and also perhaps to uh, give us your uh, perspective on, uh, uh, especially on the COVID-19 uh, influence on what you, what you have seen in the past few months, uh, not just, you know, the, the, the obvious issues, but is there something else that we're missing here? So uh, perhaps we'll start with Eagle this time. Eagle, you're, you're on mute. Okay. Yes. Thank you, first of all, uh, thank you, Massimo, for your compliment, because you know the way that Israel uh, attended the, the uh, how do you call it, the first wave, you know, of the uh, epidemia, means that we have uh, one of the best logistics in the world, you know, so I'm, I'm happy with this correlation, you know. But um, uh, talking about Israel, I can say that uh, regarding the ports, of course we saw some decline uh, with the uh, imports on the exports. It was uh, very natural because uh, a lot of uh, factories were limited uh, by their uh, uh, by, the, by their uh, manpower, and uh, we saw really a decline, but I, um, I can say that uh, the ports uh, are uh, performing uh, just uh, as normal as it can be, and we can see also that the volumes were not so, uh, were not so, uh, uh, were di didn't shrink in a way that we saw in uh, other places as uh, Massimo uh, described. Um, I think also regarding the, uh, the traffic of uh, China, we can see a real uh, recovery on, in uh, most of the uh, types of uh, cargo. Um, uh, first of all, we can look at the imports of um, crude uh, oil and uh, and the other uh, raw materials such as uh, iron ores and things like that, and we can see that they are recovering. Uh, they are coming back to the situation uh, which they had before the uh, COVID-19. So uh, I believe that some of that is uh, really uh, going to, uh, um, uh, to internal consumption because otherwise we cannot uh, we cannot explain it and it's going in the end to a into a Asia market uh, because uh, otherwise they are just uh, accumulating uh, 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 raw materials. Uh, but as I said, going back to, uh, to the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, we did not see. Um, I could say a serious uh, decrease of the uh, cargo operation. I believe that we should see it in the coming uh, one, two, three, and four months when there will be some kind of uh, a slowdown in the uh, economy of Israel, just as it is all over the, the, the world. But for now, uh, the percentage is not, it, it is not a high percentage that we can. Uh, that we can uh, notice uh, in, the, in the terminal. Thank you, Fulvia. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was, I, I knew some of the, I already saw some of the, of the slides of Massimo because, uh, you know, we, we recently published our uh, uh, three-year strategic plan of the Port of Taranto and uh, that was done uh, uh, together with SRM, with some colleagues of, of, of uh, Massimo as well. And those ideas was, uh, were at the base of our uh, analysis of the, of the market and of the evolution, because we started in, in November to, to draft this uh, strategic uh, plan, to, especially the, the analysis part, and then we had to change a lot, as you can imagine, during the, in February and March. Um, I agree with the fact that uh, 
uh, um, one of the of the uh, weapon that we have is uh, is uh, the logistic efficiency. But this is not a good point. I mean, the, because uh, Italy is there in the position in the ranking despite its logistic, and this is uh, the, the the real uh, weakness that we have because uh, we don't have we are not efficient. Uh, we are not able as uh, an economic uh, um, from the point of view of the economic actors uh, to create a big consortium big uh, to work on the offer of the logistic services in fact in italy the big bigger players that are able to provide the end to end uh, service are coming from abroad so we we are a big uh, uh, I don't know, German players that are working in our country because uh, our system is not very well connected in terms of small operators. So logistics can be one of the answers. I would say that also administrative simplification because another issue is that uh, we are very, very somehow like in the Middle Age in terms of uh, how much, much fragmented is uh, the process of uh, giving authorization of giving permits to make investments and one of the answers again uh, and also in this issue we are together with the SRM and the Gaza San Paolo is uh, the, the use of the special economic zones that the, the Italian government decided to put in some of the port of the south and then extend it also in some of the port of the north so the port system is at the center of this uh, renovated way to attract investments but again, uh, is uh, for the time being just uh, an initiative that is not well filled in with the right, uh, the, the good, uh, mm, I don't know, uh, um, uh, simplifications. But this is another, another, another issue. And, uh, and the third one is the digitalization. Uh, for sure, for sure, if you look at, uh, at the priorities in the agenda of the every kind of uh, organization, public and private, digitalization is not at the top. And also the, the people, also the, the talent, the, the knowledge, and the exp uh, people experts in, in, in uh, digitalization, IT systems, in the logistic chain as the most, most requested in the, in the market of HR. And also in our case, we, we, are, uh, um, we have identified in our strategic plan that the, the first domain of our plan is uh, innovation. Innovation in, in the, our internal processes, innovation in the logistic chain of the port, innovation in the way uh, we create opportunities for business, helping uh, big companies to solve uh, all the problems with the new methods like uh, uh, using uh, startups and uh, a new business environment. But this is at our level. With a global view, I agree with the fact that uh, the, the Nordic route is uh, a, a huge point of attention. But in that area, as you could know, there are a lot of uh, uh, things that are happening also from the environmental point of view. So the, 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 this is impacting also all the energy uh, production in the north of, 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 uh, of Russia. And all the plants are having big problems due to the fact that you know, the land is now warmer and this will, will impact from a, 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 an incredible point of view so um, I guess that the, these three points administrative simplification logistics and digitalization can, can help but uh, one last couple of last consideration from our perspective the Italian you know when something happened of this uh, impact like, like COVID, like uh, the crisis of the US in 2008, what uh, uh, you can see is how much fragmented is, uh, again, the Italian system. And uh, uh, in these days, we are uh, talking about how to relaunch the, um, the port and logistics system, but thanks to new I don't know, incentives uh, to, to the operators, to the uh, ship owners, and uh, how to help the, the system to, to, to restart. But again, uh, the, there is no a, a unique approach to the sector. And uh, there is no awareness of how much the sector is important for the Italian economy. So 
we have to work again also on 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 this side thank you brendan i thank you all for uh, really interesting stimulating uh, uh remarks uh, you'll have to forgive me um, my knowledge uh, uh, of these issues is somewhat uh, shallow and superficial so i'm going to ask some basic questions and and perhaps some of our viewers will benefit um, fr from these questions as well, um, those who may not have the, the background that uh, all of you do in these fields. Um, so I'll start with Massimo. Uh, Massimo, at the end of your comments, you suggested that a role China might be able to play is um, to help with efficiency in connecting logistics um, and connectivity, right? Uh, to, to, to increase efficiencies across the Mediterranean region. And I think that goes to the heart of what our seminar series is about, really, because when you talk about efficiencies, what you're talking about is reducing regulation and red tape. Um, and then what we've been asking uh, in, in almost each of our seminars is how that would affect the tension with security, because the spirit or the zeitgeist, if you will, of the period today is tension with China, that everyone needs to be much more focused on, on uh, uh, the potential security risks involved with China. And so the solution you're suggesting, um, I'm not, I'm certainly not challenging it. You, you certainly know the field much better than I do. But my question, I suppose, is how do you resolve that tension of China's potential to play a very helpful role in increasing efficiencies with the increasing fear of China in terms of security? Uh, so that's my question to you. Uh, to, to Igal, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why everyone's so focused on Haifa but not Ashdod. Um, you know, we hear a lot about Haifa, um, and I'm constantly asked, and I certainly can never answer this, but but why why not about Ashdod? What what is the difference? Why are people so focused on on Haifa and and less focused on Ashdod when it comes to China's involvement here in Israel? Um, and then Fulvio, I, I had a question. Um, uh, you suggested that the northern route um, is something from a competition point of view everyone should be concerned about right in the long term um, because potentially it reduces traffic through the Mediterranean um, I, I just wanted to call your attention there was an interesting remark that came from uh, an Iranian official who's in charge of the Chabahar free zone in Iran and he said that the Suez Canal will be replaced by the Chabahar corridor uh, soon or imminently. Uh, now, I, I know that many people didn't really take this comment with a great deal of seriousness, but certainly the comment represents something, right? And, and Chabahar is, is to a certain extent real. So um, I wondered if, if, if Chabahar is, and the potential of circumventing Suez traffic through an overland route is also something that uh, is being taken strategically into consideration. Okay. Uh, who, who would you like to start with? <laughs> Massimo, I suggest that you start according to the uh, order of Brandon's uh, excellent questions, and uh, after that, Enrico will have his own okay. question. Thank you. So, I, I totally agree. The key point is increasing logistic efficiency in the Mediterranean. Uh, Chinese are trying to do that with their investment. Uh, I think that increasing logistic efficiency in the Mediterranean is useful and functional to also increase China logistic efficiency inland. So this was a key point also to understand the Belt and Road. But having said so, I come back to what I, I said uh, and also put in my slide. COVID-19 uh, I agree that China has the potentiality to recovery soon from the economy point of view, from the economic point of view. But the point is that China reputation has been negatively affected by what happened. And this is very important to understand because China's strategy was based on low profile. When you want to have a low profile, you need to have or a positive or at least a neutral reputation. It's very difficult to have 
a low profile if you have a worst or a negative or, I mean, a declining reputation. So I'm not yet sure, but is an interrogative point, perhaps um, others better than me can reply, that COVID uh, and pandemic, and especially because there is pressure against China, United States is putting pressure, but not only United States, you know, Australia, UK, uh, the Five Eyes, if I remember the name, uh, but also the, uh, you know, the international press, I mean, the narrative is changing. The mood is changing. So I'm, I'm just an, uh, analyzing, it's not my opinion. I, I see the mood is changing. And when the mood is changing, it's very, very difficult, in my opinion. Uh, also, if you have the potentiality to recover the economy soon, to continue with the same timetable that was before. This is my, my uh, just one point on Suez because we study Suez, uh, we did a study in relation with Panama, when Panama was uh, opening the new enlargement of Panama two years ago. We now just finished to publish uh, this paper. If, if it's interesting to you, I will send you, it's 134 pages, just to say it's not a small paper, it's on the Arctic, very complete with a, a so, uh, a broad analysis from different angles and perspective uh, where Chinese are, are involved very, very much. And in a certain way, the Arctic can be, uh, could be in the future, an alternative or a partial alternative to Suez. Uh, we always look at other options. We know there, there was a, a rail project also in Israel and so on. We, I don't think that for the moment Suez uh, has a real alternative. So it's not for tomorrow. It's not, and when I say tomorrow, I don't say tomorrow. I don't say the next 10 years, <laughs> five, five to 10. But if the same statement uh, 10 years ago was on a stone, now it's not on a stone. I mean, uh, Something is changing, something is moving, also because perhaps no one is a real alternative, but when you have many potential, potential alternatives, and also the issue of the, oil, the cost of oil, because what we saw on the Cape of Good Hope, it's something to have in mind, because I don't think this is something on, Another hand, we do uh, the analysis on oil and energy, but we don't think that the price of oil will increase uh, and will be high, high, high in the near future or in the long future, because we are all moving or uh, renewables, uh, green energy, uh, hydrogen. Uh, there are uh, environment issues, uh, climate change, and so on. So uh, we don't think that oil will be uh, so high price of oil in the near future. So, also a longer route can be uh, an alternative. So we should keep in mind. So, but in any case, the point is, Suez is Suez. So it's very stable in a strategic uh, positioning. But there are many alternatives, and this is something to have clear in mind. So, not so sure that it was ten ten years ago. Suez ten years ago was, I mean. If you want to come to the Mediterranean, you have to pass to Suez. It, it is not yet so uh, statement uh, based on stone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Egal? Well, I have a few points. Uh, we start from the, uh, not from Ashdodin Haifa that Brandon was asking, and uh, we'll get to that later. First of all, regarding the, uh, the Arctic route, I uh, don't uh, think, uh, first of all, I am saying that never say never, you know, but. Uh, you could hear uh, already from uh, declarations coming from uh, MSG and, uh, and CMA CGM that they will not use the uh, NSR routes uh, for any liner uh, uh, shipping activity, and it is understood, you know, because it's uh, very difficult to uh, keep a, a, a fixed schedule, uh, especially during the winter time, 
uh, on a weekly service and you cannot change for the clients, you know, the route uh, each time. So I believe that uh, as Massimo said it for the, uh, the uh, uh, near future, uh, near we can say 10 uh, to 15 years even, uh, we cannot see the, a serious liner shipping activity which will influence uh, the Mediterranean. We can also look at the configuration of the liner uh, shipping uh, uh, routes in the Mediterranean and most of the lines uh, are, uh, which calls the uh, Mediterranean are selling only to the Mediterranean. And then uh, coming back to Asia, you can see that some that stop in uh, uh, just for a shipment or something in uh, the end the ports, uh, very few in uh, Port Said, uh, most of them in Gibraltar area. And uh, it could, can be done uh, also uh, uh, we shifted or selling to North Europe, so I don't see a real uh, uh, influence on the Mediterranean in the beginning. The major activity uh, today in the Arctic is uh, mainly uh, LNG activity from, uh, from the uh, uh, port of Sabeta. And uh, we know that uh, there is a lot of traffic going during the summer, and also they have to consider the season, because during the summer they are sailing uh, really to uh, eastbound uh, and uh, going to the NSR to uh, the Japan and China. But during uh, the winter, they are going uh, westward to uh, uh, Northern Europe, and normally they are shipping the, the uh, LNG in uh, the port of Zeebrug in uh, Belgium, and uh, then uh, it's going in the traditional way through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal to uh, China. So it's really experimental, but as uh, Massimo said, it, we have to keep an eye on that. It's very interesting what is developing there. And I have a, a feeling that we will have a lot of environmental uh, constraints on everybody that we like uh, to sail there uh, regarding fuels uh, and the uh, other uh, things. So this is regarding the uh, Adriatic, the, sec the Arctic, sorry. Regarding the Chinese uh, activity uh, in the uh, logistics, uh, there is something which is very important to remember, uh, that, that uh, China today, namely uh, Costco shipping, is uh, holding today is one of the major uh, uh, shipping companies in the world, and uh, I, I, I can say that. The, and I'm talking about the east-west routes, which are the main uh, shipping routes uh, between uh, Asia and the United States, and between Asia and uh, Europe. And if you are taking the uh, alliance, the Ocean Alliance, which Costco is the dominant uh, member of, that if you take it into consideration. They are having something like uh, almost 40% of the capacity uh, done by uh, by uh, the uh, by the Ocean uh, Alliance, and in, in that Costco, of course, is the dominant uh, member. It can be explained uh, mainly, I think, by the fact that uh, most of the uh, export uh, cargo is uh, being uh, controlled in the China on uh, on a CIF or on C or CF uh, terms. It means that the buyer in uh, Europe or in the States is uh, uh, buying the uh, cargo, including the transportation. If we compare it uh, to uh, the, the normal life, it is like buying you with uh, eBay with a free shipping. You know, people don't want to deal with the shipping and they buy it uh, over there. And it, it gives a lot of advantage to the uh, Chinese uh, uh, company and the uh, companies in uh, China it, uh, itself. This can explain why Costco is so dominant on the uh, in the uh, shipping activity. The uh, last uh, issue, as uh, Brandon was asking, was the the uh, Chinese. Uh, it's not the Chinese. It's the general uh, public discussion about the issue and why they are talking more about Haifa and uh, less about Ashdod. Well, it's very simple because in Ashdod the, the uh, uh, Chinese were involved. Only in the construction of the lower uh, of the lower uh, uh, parts of the uh, terminal. It means bring, building the breakwater, building the uh, uh, base of the infrastructure. When they finish the wall, they just uh, left uh, the terminal. And in Haifa, instead, the port was built by an Israeli company, and the Chinese they took a concession for uh, operation. They are going to stay there. Uh, for the coming uh, uh, 25 uh, years, or 15 plus 10. And it has to be also underlined that it is going to be a full uh, uh, Israeli company with a Chinese uh, shareholder 
and the minor uh, minor presence in the terminal, we can compare it, for example, to Pyreus, in which we can see that uh, in the uh, PCT, in the uh, terminal in uh, Pyreus, you have about 1,000 all over uh, Greek uh, employees, and the only 10 Chinese are uh, supervising the uh, uh, the activity there. Thank you, Igal. Um, Fulvia? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, in terms of uh, how much we have considered the alternatives to the Suez uh, uh, choice, uh, um, of course, uh, together with, with the SLM, we, we had uh, a wide uh, uh, performance, a wide analysis, uh, but uh, Mm, you know, the, 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 our last years, what we have learned is that uh, from the point of view of a single port, that is different fr uh, from the point of view of the, of the whole system, uh, it's very difficult to make uh, uh, analysis and to, to foresee what will happen in, in, the, in, the, in the next five, five years. It doesn't make sense to, to plan uh, uh, in, in a very detailed manner, uh, your, your strategy after five years is, is, is really so much. I remember when we, we drafted the national strategic plan, uh, at the beginning, uh, the government wanted a, a, a vision at the 2030 with the same detail that the vision of the, the, the short term it was not possible. Uh, so, in my, ob my opinion, this is the, uh, your, your, your point is a very good point, but this should be addressed by the national government. And I know that the minister declared uh, in his um, uh, plan of activities in, in uh, this year that uh, a new version of the new uh, of a national uh, ports and logistic plan will be issued uh, in the coming months, and that will be the official. Uh, place where these uh, global strategic challenges would be addressed by because this is something that you cannot compete by al alone I mean. and uh, on the other hand what we are trying to to, to create in, in Taranto just because it was a, in the last years a, a place where a lot of things bad things happen is to react with the, as I told you with with innovation and uh, to, in order to create a, a place where there is a, a, there is a reason why to invest. We are not just uh, an infrastructure, because the infrastructure is, is not enough. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not important how long is uh, your, the, your birth, how deep are your, your seabed, but it's important if someone going to Taranto is able to find a good uh, uh, connection if is enabled to find uh, the right knowledge the connection with the universities with the research center and everything uh, well, I, I was involved in a, in a, in a, in a study uh, by the president of the council of the ministers a couple of years ago we went to, um, through some special economic zones in the center of uh, Europe and most of uh, the investors they said that uh, uh, the, the, the reason why to invest in that area at the beginning was uh, fiscal incentives, but after a couple of years, the reason was because there, there is the right, the ecosystem for my business. So, of course, uh, simplification incentives are the first uh, uh, reason, but after a while, if you are able to create an, an, an ecosystem, you are giving something more than your, uh, uh, your infrastructures. Thank you, Fulvia. Enrico, you wanted to ask, and uh, perhaps we'll let Massimo uh, reply first because he has to leave very, very soon. Unfortunately. So. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'm going to be very fast, actually, and then I keep my comment for later. So I'll let Massimo leave. Thank you very much for the, for the discussion. My question are uh, three. First one is like impact of reshoring on supply chain and uh, uh, Europe uh, East Asia route. Uh, the second one is, uh, you mentioned that Chinese companies are investing in uh, improving the uh, logistic component uh, and the logistic efficiency, but logistic efficiency uh, obviously has a um, um, political uh, segment. As? Has a political uh, impact locally in the hosting country, for example, trade unions, I think. So 
Uh, if we look at Piraeus, could you see like how, for example, an operator like Costco, you know, dealt with these like uh, uh, classical local political constraints in order to uh, improve efficiency? And my last question is like the development of special economic zones in southern Italy, which is a very interesting example, in my opinion, of um, localization of, uh, uh, you say, uh, practices that are very much, you know, uh, rooted in the Chinese, you know, uh, methodology and model. So can you tell us how special economic zones in Italy are going to be developed? I mean, what's the state of the heart? Thank you. Massimo, yes, we'll go to you first. Um, I, I try to reply, uh, I mean, each question <laughs> needs uh, uh, some minutes, but I, I try to, to give you um, a, brief, a brief overview. So, uh, reassuring, just to say that uh, in general terms, I think that uh, one of the consequences of COVID-19 will be uh, worldwide, not only in Italy, uh, to push for reassuring. Uh, so, I uh, expect, for example, for some Italian companies, uh, to review their strategies, the strategies they had in the last years to to move uh, and to open uh, branches and and especially for the production, because one of the key points during the COVID crisis was also the crisis of sa some supply chain. So this is a point of um, uh, weakness for. Uh, for the global economy, but also for each company, especially for big companies. So in general terms, I see or to put more attention when deciding for uh, investing abroad, what kind of investment, if it, if it is or not strategic, the enlargement of the list of strategic sector, I mean, all a wave again to, to try to, uh, to reassure or in any case to um, to, to limit uh, foreign investment in some strategic areas. Um, political impact of investment in logistics, but not global impact, local impact. From that point of view, I think that Chinese are, are able to, to learn quickly. So it is true that, for example, dealing with uh, unions, uh, with the problems of local, uh, I mean, politics and so on is not so easy, but they learn, they learn quickly. So um, I, don't, I don't see uh, as, as a problem for, from their point of view, but it could become a problem from our, I mean, from the European point of view in that moment, because what I already said before, when your uh, view, I mean, uh, when, when the narrative about you is positive or neutral, when, when you have a low profile, but in general terms, everyone says, okay, but the Chinese, you know, they are there for business, no problem. For, when, when the narrative is positive, everything is positive. But when the narrative is not so positive, also from trade union, local politics, I mean, uh, the wave, the sound, the narrative can be different. Special economic zone, uh, I think now we are in, 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 in the good moment because after having wait a long time, because uh, this is a project uh, since two years ago, so we, we, uh, we wait two years. Now uh, all the uh, Italian ports in the south of Italy have their own uh, project for the special economic zone. Um, and, and I also think that um, what is happening in Brussels in, this, uh, in these days, I mean, the recovery fund, the Green New Deal, uh, the, the European... Uh, money to support the economy of the European countries, especially the countries where you have most heated by the crisis, and Italy was one of these, are for strategic uh, projects, not uh, helicopter money. 
and spatial economic zone for many angles are coherent with the new uh, main drivers of the European uh, Union. So also from that point of view, I think that is the right moment to start. And uh, some of some ports and the Taranto port is one of these are really, really ready. Also because well managed. And I don't say that because Fulvio is there, but because I, I really think that. Thank you so much, Massimo. I'm sorry, sorry, really sorry, but uh, I have a constraint now for another call. So, we, but we are any, very you grateful. Can always reach me if you want uh, by mail or by another call, and we can continue. So, Thank Massimo. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, hope I hope next time to be in Tel Aviv. Exactly. <laughs> we hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 Fulvio, um, Fulvio, would you like to uh, reply to Enrico's uh, question? Um, yes, I, I replied to the question where I can add something. Uh, especially, special economic zone. Uh, we are working closely with the government. Uh, the, the status of the art is that now two more Special economic zone has been approved in uh, in Sicily and um, in uh, Regione Abruzzo, and another one in uh, Sardinia is very close to be approved. So now most, almost all the southern regions has their own uh, special economic zone approved. In uh, Regione Apulia, we have also two different special economic zones. Uh, because uh, sometimes, as I told you, uh, we are able to, 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 to divide uh, what is, is not dividable. But um, this is the, the first fact. From the governance point of view, most of, uh, of the special economic zone has their governance in place. I mean, uh, the, the governance is centered on, uh, on the port authority. Then there is a special committee composed by the representatives of the regions. Uh, the new minister, uh, Provenzano decided to put a new uh, coordinator, is called the Commissario, Commissioner, on top of the existing uh, committee. So this is uh, supposed to be a special link, a direct link from government to the special economy zone. This is not a choice that has been uh, uh, welcomed by all the uh, of the regions, but anyway, this is something that is going to happen, and we are waiting. We have been waiting four months for this uh, commission because we don't feel to be so free to make choices in, in this in this moment. Um, what is interesting is that uh, uh, some of the incentives uh, are already in place. Nobody knows, but if you make an investment and you are um, spending money in one of the eligible areas of this, uh, of this law, you can have a fiscal uh, incentives. Uh, and this is not something that is controlled by the Port Authority, but this is directly from the Ministry of Econo Economy and Finance. So they are active, uh, but uh, the COVID arrived when uh, most of the mm, southern region was uh, starting to launch their marketing plan. So mm, has been somehow frozen. Uh, the, um, the European Commission is following very closely the, the process uh, because they identified an advisor uh, to support the, how can I say, design of the processes uh, to be used in order to attract and then to formalize the presence of the new investors because um, there are many different choices and they are working uh, closely with the, with, the, with the special economy zone. So we are in the middle of the, of the, of the river, I guess. And uh, some of us are more uh, active, uh, others as, uh, for instance, we are more, very active, but we don't have enough uh, uh, staff, enough people. And uh, since the law, according to the law, you cannot uh, uh, hire people for the special economy zone. You have to do something with your own uh, uh, staff. And this is uh, clever. And uh, anyhow, I, I guess it is, it is a big uh, opportunity, but the law, was not uh, built properly. So if the new government will have the, the possibility to change and to simplify, would be, would be great. Um, the, the other two questions, I, I, I don't remember the, uh, 
Uh, one, on... if you see reshoring, reshoring having an impact on uh, on um, uh, trade. I mean, on the Belt and Road, basically. So on the Europe Far East uh, route. Uh, yeah, ma, uh, from this point of view, I, I agree with the Massimo, uh, with Massimo De Andres. I don't have uh, any much to add. Uh, no, well, okay, I remember what uh, I was. I wanted to, to add something uh, regarding the the approach of the Chinese investors uh, in terms of uh, how to to deal with uh, the unions and uh, and so on. I, I agree with the fact that they learn very much. Uh, um, and they have uh, uh, their approach. I would uh, define like uh, adaptable. I mean, they are really um, having the shape of the of the of the you know, of the, the the place where they have to go. And they, I really was surprised because uh, you know when you hear about this investment, like in Piraeus, uh, you hear about these uh, big com Chinese companies. Uh, going there, I am the boss, you have to work, I don't want to work with nobody, I'm very close, there is a wall between the port and the, and the business environment. What we experience, but I, I, I repeat, this is just, we, we don't have a direct Chinese investment for the time being, but their approach was really different. And we saw people very, very well prepared about the, the situation and very open to, to collaborate and aware of the Italian law and of the Italian uh, situation. Uh, in our, in our uh, report, we received very recently a request for concession by, this is, uh, is public uh, information, by the Ferretti Group, that is uh, a Chinese multinational owned by, also by Chinese companies in the field of uh, yachting. And this is very important because they will, they, the idea is to, to create within the port a place where to build luxury yacht and this really change the shape and also the 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 change of the port and it will help the differentiation of our of our business thank you fulvia egal yes i would like only to add to a few things uh, which were said here first of all regarding uh, efficiency we have to understand that efficiency does not mean you know that they are entering to a foreign port and they are changing changing uh, uh, rules and regulations. Uh, the uh, efficiency, me uh, efficiency means, for example, that they are increasing the number of direct uh, calls. If, for example, uh, taking into consideration, for example, the port of uh, Taranto, if you want to enjoy from the rich uh, industrial uh, uh, interland of uh, Taranto, you have to call uh, Taranto in a direct call and you don't uh, uh, call uh, Naples or uh, Bari, but you have to go uh, to Toronto as a port, uh, as a domestic port, unless you want to make it also a, a, a transshipment hub, and this is another uh, issue. So efficiency means that you are calling the port by itself. Of course, by being in the terminal, uh, being in the port, you can also influence on uh, the uh, improvement of uh, customs and uh, procedures and the uh, and the other things you can influence on that, but you cannot uh, change it. I have also to say that sometimes we are also getting, uh, I don't want to say we, but they say that uh, one can get a sensation uh, from the Chinese. Uh, they, they, they don't, uh, I mean, they learn, they, uh, they uh, learn, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say to the learn fast, but I have sometimes the, the feeling that they are looking on uh, the Western way of conducting things in a way of uh, supremacy, you know, and uh, it seems that sometimes they are, they do not understand how we succeed to run the world in the way that we are doing it. Uh, and uh, they, are learning, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are learning the procedures, but I, I'm not sure that they understand the, 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 the procedure. But, uh, uh, the presence in the terminals reminds me that uh, years ago, for example, the, we had a new f fashion in the uh, shipping industry that uh, suddenly, I think it was something like, uh, let's say, 20 years ago, in generalizing the phenomena, 20 years ago, shipping companies started to uh, purchase, to acquire uh, terminals. Uh, Maersk, you know, started to buy terminals, then uh, and other companies came to that. Uh, MSC became a very active uh, terminal operator, and uh, I remember that on that time in the industry, there was the, uh, the idea 
that those uh, shipping companies are, uh, are, are uh, taking uh, concessions and they are operating terminals in order uh, to uh, favor it, you know, and uh, to assist their own activity of shipping companies. So for example, they say that uh, it will save data and that Maersk is buying a terminal in order to facilitate and to assist Maersk activity in the future. So I think that uh, this was also done by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Chinese interests. We have to understand that China is not controlling all the terminals in the Mediterranean. They are just taking a key points and you know they are investing there. Maybe the idea is uh, in the future, you know, to assist and to support the Chinese uh, uh, export to, uh, by talking about the liner shipping, to assist the Chinese exports to uh, Europe, in the, the States and other countries because this is the uh, most important, uh, most important uh, uh, thing. So this is my idea regarding the efficiency and the reason for the Chinese presence in the, uh, in the terminal. And I think that there are some terminals which are a real strategic uh, points. And uh, I think I talked with you already about that, that I think that in Piraeus, it is all only that they are uh, they are uh, calling Piraeus for uh, economic reasons. I think that we can see today in uh, Piraeus uh, a, a new gateway, a new entrance uh, to Europe, which is substituting the North European uh, ports. You know, for example, moving a container uh, in the past from uh, the, uh, uh, let's say importing a container in the past from Asia to uh, Budapest to Hungary was usually done uh, through Hamburg. The ship was coming to Hamburg or to Bremerhaven, and then by train it was going to, uh, to even to Vienna, even to Austria, to Hungary, to Poland, etc. What we can see now is that the Chinese uh, are uh, uh, building a new gateway. They bring their cargo to Paris, and then you have a few daily trains which goes up, you know, all the way to uh, to the Balkans and even to, uh, to Hungary and uh, what we call the 17 plus one uh, 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 countries. It means that they do not need anymore the gateway in Hamburg or Bremen and that stuff. This is, this is something which will happen in the future. For now, the activity is very limited, but what we see is a new routing of cargo entering into Europe. And I have the feeling that the uh, port authorities in all the Europe, uh, Holland, Germany, you know, and uh, that area, I feel very uncomfortable with the development of uh, Paris. If uh, we, uh, everybody, I think, remember that uh, the Chinese are also uh, bidding uh, on the uh, uh, on the train from Paris uh, up to the uh, Balkans, and uh, then uh, the Ferrovia dello Stato, the Italian uh, the train, uh, succeeded. Uh, to win the bid, but uh, even so, the Chinese came to uh, a, a third uh, party into that uh, the train activity, and they are operating that line. So, Paris is a new routing uh, up uh, to Europe. Maybe it also explains the. Uh, uh, it is another a continuation of the big interests of uh, uh, China with all those uh, uh, countries of the 17 uh, plus uh, plus uh, one. And this is another possibility. So actually, logistic-wise, you are connecting all that area of Central Europe and Eastern Europe, one side through the land by the uh, by the famous uh, road, you know, the uh, on the uh, on the weekly or daily trains which are going from China and from the sea from Paris, and then actually you are connecting all that area in a, new, a completely new way which is emphasizing the position of the uh, Paris and is also emphasizing the position of the Suez Canal, because you cannot do this through from a other uh, direction. This is not the case of other terminals, because for example, if you take the new uh, uh, interest, or not the new interest, the, the entrance of uh, China to the uh, or Costco shipping ports, for example, to the new terminal in uh, Vado Ligue in uh, near uh, the Sabona, near Genova, it, it is not a new routing of uh, cargo. It is true that uh, the APMT, you know, Maersk terminals, they were really, uh, I would say, a little bit tired from what happened to them in Genova, in Gold, to another terminal, and they decided to build their own terminal in Savona. But I think that uh, it is a local, it is like a gateway. The same you can also adhere to uh, Valencia, because everybody was looking on the purchase of Noatum, you know, the Spanish company by... Uh, by Costco is a revolution in the Mediterranean, but it is gate port. It is not something which we can see in Paris, which to my opinion, 
is a completely changing of the routing of the cargo into uh, the uh, 17 plus one uh, area. Sorry, and, uh, if I may, just uh, uh, Igal, so, so this is the reason why Costco is investing so much is uh, intermodal hubs, like for example, the one in Budapest, uh, the Bilk, um, the big hub, uh, hub. I think so. If you can see, uh, if you can look on Perios and the Chinese uh, interests are not, uh, they, they are not stopping there. I think that it, uh, uh, I think it was a few months ago that the Greek, uh, the Greek government uh, refused uh, to uh, start building uh, another uh, stage, another uh, container terminal in Perios uh, and uh, making other investments because I think that also uh, you know, today, today Costco shipping is a uh, port, is, is controlling completely the port of Peru. They have also the majority in the uh, port authority of uh, Peru. When we are talking about the signing of the uh, MOU, not the uh, between the countries, but the, the, on the MOU between the, uh, the, uh, the, the port of uh, Peru, the port authority, and the, the Autorita Portuale of Trieste, it is very funny to see that the Chinese guy is signing in the name of the Port Authority of uh, Peru when he's uh, visiting and uh, signing the uh, agreement of cooperation between the two port uh, authorities. But I think, as I said, uh, Enrico, that if we, what we see is a, a completely new routing of cargo entering to uh, uh, Europe, which will really uh, cut a lot of... Um, uh, of a market share from the northern European port. Uh, uh, Thank you, Igal. I think that this also means that, uh, as, as always, when you change uh, trade routes and uh, shipping routes and uh, logistic lines, it means a huge impact on local society in different places there, but that exceeds the, the, the limits of our uh, uh, discussion. I would just like, if, if you could, in, uh, in a very sh short, uh, uh, time, uh, Fulvio and Egal, uh, remark, because one of the things that we keep talking about is China's involvement and China's uh, investments and so on and so forth. But the way that both China and the U.S. framed their relationship as a competition in recent years uh, means that we are trying to find that competition. And uh, uh, I would like you as, as the people, as I said earlier, on the ground, on the sea, um, do you see any competition when you are engaging in various investment projects, whatever that you are doing? Do you see a competition from, let's say, the U.S. or American companies or even European major companies when it comes to your own uh, projects? Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, uh, what I see is that uh, <clears throat> your port becomes uh, interesting after that the Chinese have visited, of course. Uh, and I said, no, no, really, because, uh, uh, of course, we, we are a, a public entity. So we, our doors are open to all the investors. We don't have any, uh, any, any, I mean, everything is, is welcome. But uh, the fact that <clears throat> we uh, received some, and everything was public, some visits from the Chinese companies, there were uh, many reactions in the public opinion in some uh, uh, political parties. And this is uh, <clears throat> linked to the fact that, that you know, the, this is uh, uh, somehow perceived as a, as a problem. But uh, we are our mandate is to, to valorize and to, to attract investments and to valorize the, the huge public investments that have been done. So coming back to your question, uh, I, I, um, the competition is uh, where, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, both parties has uh, the, the willing to invest and to create business and to create uh, logistic activities there. Uh, it's like if, uh, I repeat, in our case, uh, we, 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 we became uh, interesting uh, because someone uh, arrived and they decided to, to, to invest, but not because there was a real interest in Taranto, because we didn't receive so many visits, I mean, right. uh, from all over the world. And, uh, but it's a strategic position. Of course, we are in the middle of the med, we are very close to other public entities, uh, military, 
sites there. So this can be seen uh, as, a, as, a, a, as a problem. But in my opinion, having uh, the right balance of investment, uh, of course, sometimes we receive the, also from, from the Emirates, this is of investors. The, the approach was how can I buy the land, the port? How can I buy the, the land, a part of the port? So we, uh, we, we are not allowed to do that. So we have the, the, the concession as, a, as an instrument that has to be published. So I mean, I mean there are some tools that uh, if you are able to balance uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, the different stakeholders uh, and the parties, uh, you, you can somehow manage to use my, my opinion. Thank you. Miguel? Mute. Well, first of all, as uh, Fulvio was mentioning, you know, regarding the, the international interests in Italy, I think that there are more people interested in buying uh, a villa in uh, Toscana or in Puglia than those which are interested in buying a villa in Haifa or Rostov. But, uh, but uh, uh, being uh, more uh, serious, I would say that, uh, and this is the political mind which I am very careful, I want to bypass it and to dismantle it before we will uh, talk about it, because as I said in the beginning, my expertise logistics, not, uh, not uh, other things. But I think that, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the discussion, we have to understand that today uh, Costco shipping, uh, Costco shipping, is uh, controlling uh, almost 20% of the traffic between Asia, not China, Asia in general, and uh, the United States. Uh, Costco shipping in uh, general is uh, holding almost the same percentage between Asia and uh, Europe. And I mentioned before that the alliance in which they are is controlling something like 40%. It means that, that if we are looking on the competition between the United States and China, there is no competition in the logistics, in the logistic aspect, because they, they, you don't have almost any uh, uh, serious presence of the American uh, companies, as American companies, in the uh, global uh, logistics. I mean, you can find some uh, ships which are still sailing with the uh, American flag, uh, mainly regarding uh, governmental uh, cargoes. But uh, there is no, uh, there is no presence there, so we are forced to work with, not with, the world is uh, forced to work with the uh, Chinese uh, shipping companies, which are, which are giving an excellent uh, service to the uh, client, but you don't have the possibility to, uh, to uh, choose the American side. Uh, and as I said before, we're talking about the Chinese export, which until now is uh, the most uh, dominant in the world, uh, due to the fact that the cargo is mostly controlled in uh, China on the, on the, um, on a CNDF or CIF basis, it, it, it will continue the trend unless, as Massimo said, there will be a change in the, in the globalization process and the, the industry will start to go back to, to, the, to the West, which I really, I have my doubts uh, about it. I don't see that the industry, you know, people are talking about uh, against the globalization. People are quite concerned about a lot of disruptions in the uh, supply chains uh, during the COVID-19 uh, 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 period. But uh, when things will, uh, will pass away, I have the feeling and my experience shows, uh, my experience shows that people have uh, a very short memory when it comes to uh, to economies and to uh, the costs of living and stuff like that. Thank you very much, Igal. Thank you very much, Fulvio. Thank you, Enrico and Brandon. Uh, I would like to end with that note and uh, let's hope for a better time and healthier times. And uh, next time, Israel, Italy, Beijing, wherever we can. Thank you.